Um, what's interesting is that uh, we are at the crossroads between different disciplines like plant biology, environmental chemistry, and micrometeorology. Uh, we will focus mainly on micrometeorology because it's a very powerful, powerful tool to describe air vegetation exchange processes. <clears throat> It is a scientific discipline with, which deals with the behavior of the lowest layer of the atmosphere where exchange phenomena with the surface occur. Um, the lowest layer is the atmospheric boundary layer. I, I think uh, <clears throat> I am just uh, talking about very well-known uh, features. And the, the transport of physical and chemical variables across the, the ABL <clears throat> occurs through micrometeorological processes. So the next slide will illustrate the difference between the large-scale meteorology, which is the synoptic one, and the micrometeorology. Uh, micro so the synoptic uh, meteorology covers um, large, very large air areas, areas like entire entire continents with we we have anticyclones perturbations which can extend over thousands of kilometers as you can see uh, from this uh, meteorological map then <clears throat> uh, on the contrary in the boundary layer air motion extends over very short distances rang ranges and also time um, intervals uh, atmospheric variables such as temperature, wind speed, and so on, <clears throat> uh, undergo fluctu fluctuations, which are apparently random variations are around, around their mean values. This is an example of the plot uh, representing uh, 19, uh, 90 seconds period, so one and a half minutes, Stop. where you have a lot of, yes. So there, there is, yeah, just, sorry for the interruption. There is a message that if you can click on this, there is a message that we can see yes. on your screen. So you just can get rid of that uh, one. Uh, no, I see it. there is a message. Arrêtez yes. le partage masqué, no. Meet Google. No, I didn't. meet Google. I, I, it's in no. Italian. I, I, don't, I don't see this message. Mask, no. Uh, just, yeah, that's perfect. Ah, because we didn't see it. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I don't see myself, but you you, you see me. Okay, or not? Yes, we we we, so, we still can see. Yeah. Can Can I go on? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so, <clears throat> so we have a lot of variables here during these uh, uh, ninety seconds. You have the uh, the three uh, components of the wind vector, the vertical one. Then you have the south to north u uh, west to east v temperature temperature humidity <clears throat> moisture sulfur dioxide ozone no2 and so all these variables are very uh, fluctuate fluctuating as you can see and you see also the the, the difference between micro meteorology and synoptic meteorology is a matter of scales and uh, uh, spatial and temporal scales are correlated with each other. And for instance, you have here, um, this is, um, this scheme describes very well <clears throat> uh, this aspect, uh, because you have, for instance, the synoptic meteorology, which extends over hundreds or thousands of kilometers with um, characteristic period of um, more than one day you have the, depre the de depressions, anti anticyclones, and so on. Then you have the mesoscale, uh, which um, are where you have the breezes, orographic circulations, urban meteorology, and so on. And at the end, at the right end of this table, you have micro the micrometeorological range, uh, where you have the turbulence. And at the very end, you have friction, which is, um, simply the fact that the, the eddies are uh, dissipating uh, um, are, are smaller and smaller. Uh, finally, they are dissipating um, in the form of thermal energy. Okay. So we can use, of course, to see the scales uh, um, visually. You can do 
the, we can use the spectral analysis. We calculate the Fourier transform of the variations of the meteor quantities, and we obtain the spectrum where the amplitudes of the variations are plotted as functions of their frequency. So we do the harmonic analysis, and this is the famous van der Hoven spectrum, which has been designed uh, 60 years ago by, uh, by this scientist. Uh, this is on in logarithmic scale. The, 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 um, the ordinates are in logarithmic scale, and you see the two peaks, which is one is of the synoptic range, and the other one is the, in the micro meteorological range. And between the two, you have the so called spectral gap, where you have practically no fluctuations. But this is not always true because sometimes the spectral gap completely disappears due to the mm, mesoscale phenomena, like, for instance, the famous uh, um, large eddy, large eddies, and so on. But this is another problem <clears throat> which we'll done, uh, which is a, a, a very important chapter. Then this is another uh, example of spectrum, which is more precise, I would say, because it uh, has been constructed on the basis on uh, one, year um, one year observations uh, made on the tower, on Meteor Tower in Denmark. And here, you, this is in a linear scale, because here you see the very strong maximum of the synoptic meteorology and the very wake um, maximum of the micro meteorological range. In between, you have the spectral gap. gap. Uh, as you can see, it's not so pronounced, the gap. And then you see a very sharp peak, which corresponds to the, to the daily cycling, of course. So it's very, very interesting. Now, <clears throat> the initiator of micrometeorology was Osborne Reynolds, <clears throat> who lived uh, mainly in the 19th, cent uh, uh, 19th century. And he had the brilliant idea of expressing meteorological variables as a sum of a mean and a, and a mean value and a fluctuation. And this is the very simple formula. Of course, it's a, any variable can be decomposed in these two parts. Of course, it's a definition, but it's very useful because it separates the, 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 the mean trends of the, the variable and these uh, very rapid uh, fluctuations, as you can see from this graph, which represents a 25 minutes plot of temperature measurement. You, you, you see here the fluctuations, and you see also these means, the five minute means, uh, which I represented here on this graph. Okay. Uh, then <clears throat> uh, we all already told, said that it's uh, focused on the small scale. And that's the reason why it's called micrometeorology. And the important aspect of <clears throat> that is the, that the, the, in the boundary layer, you have uh, practically all variables are turbulent. And the turbulence is there for two reasons, two main reasons. First, a me me mechanical one, because of the drag of air in contact of roughness elements, like trees, hills, and houses and so. And even uh, one spoke of moving uh, roughness elements like cows for, cows, for instance. Then you have the differential heating of air layers in contact with the soil, which triggers convection. And this is the thermal cause. So this is just an image of, turbulent, of, of a turbulent process. Uh, other images, uh, you have the testing of a rocket, uh, which causes this very in these shapes or for for instance a volcano eruption and th these are examples of developed turbulence now this is uh, an interesting uh, photograph because you see this uh, the smoke of these cigarettes of this well-known actor <clears throat> where you see the transition between the laminar and turbulent uh, flow the problem uh, in the study of turbulence and is that it's very difficult to predict uh, when this laminar flow will be divided in uh, vortices or eddies to form the turbulence. And uh, the, there are a lot of theories and no one is fully satisfactory. That, that's what's exciting in the study of turbulence. 
Then a little bit of history. <coughs> um, Joseph Louis Lagrange, who was a, a Italian and French uh, mathematician, well known, and Euler, and uh, um, Lagrange wrote, here I uh, translate in English, <coughs> we owe to Euler the first general formulae this describing the motion of a fluid represented in simple and limpid form with partial derivatives. If these equations can be integrated, we can determine completely and in all cases the motion of a fluid driven by any force. This was, of course, in the 17th century, no, in the 18th century, it was the idealism of the pure rational physics, uh, uh, which is deterministic which was deterministic. Of course, there is something which doesn't work here. What doesn't work uh, is the, the fact that you have a lot, a, a very huge number of degrees of freedom. And so you cannot integrate the, these equations, which are the Navier-Stokes equation and so on. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the consequence of that <clears throat> is that the, the determinism of classical dynamics appear to, appears to be no longer va valid. <clears throat> so the systems seem to behave randomly. And you can calculate only a probability of the future states of the system, a little bit like in quantum mechanics. You cannot determine uh, exactly where your air particle will be, <clears throat> uh, will be after five minutes, for instance. So we can say that micrometeorology is not an exact science, it's a quasi-exact science. Uh, that's what's exciting. <clears throat> so now we pass <clears throat> to the experimental and observation aspect of the turbulence. Uh, here, I, this photograph represents an old-fashioned historic turbulence probe. Uh, homemade at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And uh, you, th this is able to measure uh, the fluctuations for the three dimensions of the wind vector. So you have the modulus of the vector, which is measured by the, this propeller. And then you have uh, the, the Q, the tail of the, the song, which can be inclined um, uh, in function of the vertical wind. So it, it goes up and down, and you can deduce the angle, from the angle of inclination, you can deduce the vertical wind component. And of course, the sound, the, the probe is oriented uh, with the horizontal wind, so we can find the, the wind direction and the two horizontal com components of the wind vector. And the, uh, the response, <coughs> the response time of this sound was about uh, one third, one third of a second, which is not bad for turbulence measurements. And uh, this um, sound, this uh, probe can be appended um, <coughs> to a desert balloon. <coughs> of course, now we use a more sophisticated technological instrument, which is the sonic anemometer, uh, where you have no moving elements, no moving parts, because it's uh, <coughs> there are uh, it, the principle. Um, consists in um, ultrasonic pulses between these uh, sensors and uh, from the, 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 the speed, the modification of the sound speed by the wind, you can deduce the three components of the wind vector. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we, uh, of course, I already <clears throat> told some words about determinism and stochastic um, problems. Here, this is a, a graph showing the ultraviolet spectrum of a molecule, <coughs> a part of it. And you, 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 have, uh, you have here, you see here a lot of lines, absorption lines. Um, this spectrum has been obtained in a cell where you can control the uh, conditions, the length of the cell, of course, the temperature, the pressure, and also, and, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, the fact is that if you measure the same thing um, in, in, in two, two centuries ahead, you will, uh, with the same conditions of temperature, pressure, and so on, you will obtain exactly the same spectrum. Now, in micrometeorology, 
the problem is completely different because you have <coughs> this plot of temperature, 25 minutes, it's the same I showed before. Um, you will never be able to reproduce exactly the same shape because it's turbulent, because it's not, it doesn't seem to be deterministic. Maybe it is, but we are not able to, to see uh, all the details of the eddies which are composing the airflow. So this is the, the important difference become between determinism and uh, a stochastic phenomena. Okay, now we go back to the uh, vegetation and so on. <clears throat> um, the, the, in the interest of micrometeorology it does, it, is that it gives a method to measure fluxes of gases between the atmosphere and the surface, thanks to the Reynolds decomposition, which I'll, I already cited, uh, which produces this very simple formula, which equates the flux with the co covariance between the vertical wind and the concentration of the gas, which will, uh, which you measure. Uh, of course, this, this represents a little bit better <coughs> the process. So you have here two variables, which is the vertical wind and the concentrations of uh, <coughs> some gas. And uh, so you decompose it in uh, mean value for, say, one half an hour and fluctuation. And after, uh, then you make a second averaging process and you obtain the covariance between these two. And this is considered as equal to the flux. Of course, it's not so simple because you, you have to make a lot of mathematical developments. Maybe we can skip them, but I will show you just rapidly uh, that in reality, you start from the Navier-Stokes equation and you put in the Navier-Stokes equation, the decomposition, the Reynolds decomposition, you develop it. And after some, some calculations, you obtain the, <clears throat> you, you see that the, the, the covariance between the vertical wind and the concentration appears here. And I, I will skip it, but just to, to show an example, this is a plot showing a measurement uh, which lasted, uh, this represents 51 seconds, so less than one minute. And the upper curve is the NO2 concentration um, measured with a very fast response instrument. And the lower curve is the vertical wind. And you see that the two curves are quite correlated. So you see this maximum, these uh, positive fluctuations of the vertical wind, which means that there is a bubble of air which is going up. And uh, you see the, that this corresponds exactly to a positive fluctuation of the NO2 concentration. What does that mean? That means that this bubble, which is going up, contains more NO2 than the surrounding air. So it is an upward flux. And this is exactly described by the uh, this formula <coughs> uh, of the covariance. So this is just to convince people that uh, uh, this method is working. Okay. And uh, of course, we have to combine, um, using this method, we combine the sonic anemometer with a chemical fast response probe like this one. This one, which is an ozone <coughs> chemiluminescent uh, measure, measuring device, uh, which is also fast response. And we, you, you make the correlation between these two things. And you have here, um, uh, K KH20, we, this is a, um, an open pass spectroscopic measurement of water vapor, which is also fast response. So you have all this data ready for uh, eddy covariance calculations. Now, <clears throat> now we can apply this method, of course, to estimate damage to plants. But of course, no, it's not so, <coughs> so straightforward. And uh, in our institute, we were invited by a farmer producing onions. And he complained that uh, in the year, during the year before, 
uh, most of his onion yield had been destroyed by ozone pollution. So we came, uh, and, and since we were, we are working for the European Commission, which is considered as very rich, the farmer expected a money compensation for the, for the loss of his production. So we organized a measure, measuring campaign to de determine the quantity of ozone deposited on these onion fields. This is the onion field. As you can see, it's quite large. It's very well suited for eddy covariance measurement because it requires very flat terrain with no obstacles. And this is our our measuring station, but you can see it better here with this. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> with the sonic anemometer here, the humidity meter here. The ozone is uh, hidden uh, in, in this plastic to protect it from rain, of course, but it, it did not rain. This is the aerial view of the onion field. This is a pluviometer. And uh, these are the measurements. <coughs> what does that mean? Does the, the, so this, the arrows are, of course, the wind uh, speed and direction. This, uh, the ozone concentration is shown here ozone concentration, then you have the uh, ozone fluxes, which are the total ones and the stomatal ones. Uh, we'll speak of the stomatal uh, fluxes in one minute, because it's very a very important factor. And you have here um, the sensible and latent fluxes. So the uh, latent flux is, of course, the evaporation. <clears throat> and uh, an important uh, feature is that there was a water supply the irrigation by the farmer on the 25th of June. And just after, the day after, there was a, a burst of evaporation, of course, because the soil was full of water. So the latent flux was, was much higher. But of course, the, um, the uh, sensible flux was lower because the sum of the two are more or less uh, not uh, more or less constant. So, <clears throat> but after having analyzing this campaign, no damage due to ozone was observed, and the farmer was quite disappointed because he got no compensation, and the crop yield loss was due to a parasite, and not to ozone. But this does not mean that ozone does not damage plants because it depends on the species, depends on the variety, on the conditions, and so. And for instance, you have these photographs who show damage due to ozone, uh, which is visible damage. <coughs> uh, and this problem has been studied a lot in a lot, a lot of publications. And this is uh, these are potato leaves, and these these are snap bean leaves, and the, this this browning bronzing of the leaves is very characteristic of ozone attack. <coughs> so. But now um, the problem, as I already told, is not only the total ozone flux, but the stomatal one. The stomach, uh, why the stomatal fluxes <clears throat> are so important? Because the, the pollutant penetrates the plant tissues through the stomata. This is a, a um, electron microscope view of the leaf surface of uh, broad bean, and you see these small holes, which are opening and uh, closing as a function of the of some physiological aspects or also of the wind speed on the radiation. There are a lot of factors and they regulate the exchange of gases between the plant and air. And so you have the, the CO2, uh, the water vapor, the oxygen, which are going out and in and out the plant, but the pollutants use these holes as doors to penetrate in the plant and to damage uh, the cells. So it's important to have not only the total flux, but the stomatal flux. How can you, ah, the, there is a, another, this is the, uh, again, the onions campaign, where you see that th this lasted for more, more or less to, from 20 of May to Nine, uh, nine of uh, July, which was the harvest. <laughs> okay, and so the upper curve is the total flux. The lower curve is the stomatal flux. And you can see that, the, and the, 
the green arrows are watering events, so irrigation, which was made more or less every week. And you can see that just after uh, each watering, you have a strong peak of stomatal flux of ozone. Here, 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 and here. And uh, of course, the, these peaks correspond also to the total flux because um, the, the total flux is the sum of the stomatal one and other factors. But you see that uh, the stomatal flux determines the fluxes of ozone in general. So it's very important to derive them. But the problem is that we, we are not able to measure uh, that uh, factor directly. There are some, um, some tentative uh, work <coughs> Uh, using uh, enclosure, leaf enclosure, but it's very complicated, very difficult to, and the, the system is not ready to work well uh, yet <laughs> to this day. So we use an algorithm to calculate this, <clears throat> the stomatal flux. How do we proceed? Uh, we use the fact that inside the stomata, the flow is no longer turbulent, it's laminar. So it makes it makes it more easy to to, to model it, and since it's laminar, it's um, proportional. So the ozone flux inside the stomatal cavity is proportional to the um, water vapor flux inside the, the stomata. The turbulence uh, is vanishing because of the very reduced dimensions. Of the of the stomatal cavity, which is uh, a few microns, and here, since you have a laminar flow, um, the turbulence uh, there is no turbulent flow, but it's a molecular flow, and um, you, you have molecular diffusion. And the molecular diffusion is easy to model because it, the, there is the Fick law of diffusion. Uh, which where, where you see that the gradient is proportional to uh, the diffusion coefficient, the molecular diffusion coefficients, which are constants and uh, um, characteristic for every kind of uh, chemical species. So you have um, here the ratio between the molecular diffusion of water vapor and ozone, which is equal to 1.65, which is absolutely constant. <laughs> And this can, we, if you are, uh, if you can calculate or measure the uh, stomatal flux of water vapor, you can calculate, um, thanks to this ratio, uh, the same factor for ozone. Okay, but you have to, of course, to to calculate this <coughs> uh, stomatal resistance for water vapor, and this can be done through the penman montis equation, which is a monster, <laughs> of course, uh, by measuring the evaporation flux. So the latent, um, latent heat flux, which is uh, described here by lambda E. And you, uh, so you measure it directly also by eddy covariance, the lambda E. And you have all these, uh, I, I will not go into details, but you can, you can uh, have access to all these uh, quantities and you obtain the surface resistance for water vapor. So I, I, I read it the calculations because <laughs> this is my own writing. So it's, uh, I wanted to really uh, understand because it was not so straightforward, uh, the sense of this penman montis method. Okay. <clears throat> and finally you obtain that. <laughs> And this is the, uh, the, I would say, the flow chart um, summarizing this process. So we have the water vapor flux measured by eddy covariance with the um, rapid, sen uh, rapid sensor for water vapor and the sonic anemometer. So it yields the lambda E. You use the um, penman montis equation. You get the stomatal resist resistance for water vapor. You transform it to the stomatal resistance for ozone calculated with the aid, <coughs> uh, with the help of this uh, ratio. 
Then you calculate the stomatal flux for ozone, uh, dividing the ozone concentration measured at the height of the uh, canopy, the vegetal canopy, divided by, by this uh, stomatal resistance for ozone, and you obtain the stomatal ozone flux. It seems simple, but it's not. <laughs> And there are a lot of uh, shortcomings sometimes because <clears throat> the, the conditions of applicability of this uh, system is not always fulfilled. And then you have the total ozone flux measured by eddy covariance, which is measured independently from that process. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there, is, there are some problems. For instance, the method works if you don't have a direct evaporation from the soil. So all evaporated uh, water, uh, water vapor flux uh, must come from the plants, from the leaves, from the stomata. Uh, if you, so this can work only with uh, a very dry soil, which is generally the case uh, during the summer for agricultural fields. But if you don't, uh, if your soil is wet, then you have to measure the the direct water vapor flux from the soil using a lysimeter for a lysimeter, for instance, which can be done, of course, in a forest, for instance. Then the turbulent state of the atmosphere must be stationary. And that, that's the reason why you eliminate, you discard the nighttime measurements, because uh, in the night, the stationarity is not always fulfilled. Then you have, uh, you must have a horizontally homogeneous um, measuring site, which was the case for our onions, of course. Now we, we did a lot of campaigns in over various kinds of ecosystems, forests, clearings, um, beech spruce forest, uh, and so on. So in, in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain. Now I will give you an example of another application of micrometeorological micro methods, which was the campaign in Germany and the Kölolo forest in the Fichtelgebirge, uh, which is located near the Czech border. And it, this was this was exactly the contrary. The, the, the goal of this campaign was to study the inhomogeneity of a terrain. And here you see a forest, and in the, the middle of the forest, you have a clearing. And this clearing has been created uh, because there was a, a thunderstorm which destroyed the trees in this part. And so the, the, the organizers wanted to know how um, the turbulence is behaving um, at the border of uh, these two kinds of uh, surfaces. And there were about 10 German groups, plus our group, conducted by, coordinated by Professor Thomas Fokken from Bayreuth, and there are a lot of towers. There was one tower very high in the middle of the forest, which was a spruce forest. Then we there was a, the edge forest where, where I had my instruments and uh, a small tower in the middle of the clearing, just to, to see a kind of horizontal gradient of the phenomena. This was, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the site was uh, called Kölolo. <clears throat> And uh, this, this is uh, uh, the edge tower. So it's just the other limit between the forest and the clearing. This is the small tower at the, in the middle of the clearing. And now some results. Uh, I just represented here the, uh, the um, ozone fluxes, both stomatal and uh, total. And uh, here the, the upper uh, frame represents the clearing and the lower one, the spruce forest. And as you can see, the fluxes, both stomatal and total, are much in, more important in the forest than uh, at the clearing, because probably for two reasons, but this is just a hypothesis, I think that over the forest, turbulence is more active because, uh, the, the, because of the, the, the eddies are more, more powerful because of the, um, the roughness of the forest. So uh, the, the mixing between the layers of uh, within the boundary layer are more important. So the fluxes are higher. And also the, the surface, um, the leaf surface, which are also, of course, needles, the leaf surface is, is much more important in the forest than uh, on the grass, which covers the clearing. 
So you have more fluxes in the forest. Okay. Then <clears throat> another campaign we made in ISPRA, in our institute, uh, we, we also have a forest, which is a mix of forests. There are pines, there are, um, there are oaks and um, various. So it's, it's a mixed forest. It was a 37 meters high tower. And uh, the interest of this experiment is that it lasted for three uh, years. So it's uh, much longer <clears throat> than the previous campaigns. So you see here where uh, the, the, the lo geographical location between, so just at the extreme, the very northern part of Italy. And this is uh, explain better. You, you see here the, the Lake Maggiore. So Ispra is here and you see the snow covered Alps. And this is uh, an example of summer conditions. So you have the wind, uh, the, the horizontal wind uh, vector. And you see that there is a very regular uh, mountain breeze circulation because of the, the valley of the Ticino River. And you see that, for instance, during the day, it comes from the south and during the night from the north. This is a very classical breeze circulation. But be because the Ticino Valley is a, a kind of long tube, north sounds, and uh, there is a very strong channeling effect. So you have the ozone concentration, which was increasing gradually during this uh, uh, eight day period, the fluxes of ozone, stomatal and total, the air temperature, air humidity, sensible and latent heat flux. Uh, the, <clears throat> so the series are regular, regular, clear sky, anticyclone, mountain valley breeze, and uh, everything was increasing gradually, no rain, and the day night cycle uh, for almost all variables, stomatal to ozone flux, uh, to total ozone flux uh, ratio was about 30 to 40 percent. Now, this is just uh, another map. Uh, to, to uh, This is the Ticino River va Valley. Oops. This is the Ticino River Valley, which is quite long because it's uh, about 250 kilometers between the, 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 the upper part is between the mountains and also the lake part. This is the plain here, um, but the, pla the, the breeze circulation can be felt or also uh, in, the, in the plain because it's very strong. Here you have the Milan city area, the metropolitan area, which is, uh, um, creates a lot of air pollution because it's 3 million inhabitants, a lot of industries and um, traffic. And at the west of the city, you have the, the Po um, River Plain rice fields area, <coughs> which is quite extended, and uh, where, where we have been measuring methane fluxes also, because you know that <coughs> rice fields are um, strong methane emitters. Another aspect uh, of the site where we were working is the the presence of the uh, occurrence of uh, fern events. The fern is the, you, you know about fern, which is equivalent to the Chinook winds uh, in, in the Rockies. So you have very strong, hot and dry winds coming from the mountains, from the other side of the Alpine range. And this is a typical sky um, with uh, Altocumulus lenticularis. <clears throat> Uh, and this perturbs completely the shape, the, the day-night cycle of the meteorological variable. So this wind is coming down from the Alps. Uh, is uh, it, At high altitudes, it, it's laminar, but at lower altitudes, it's very turbulent, as you can see from the, the waves on the lake. So this is a plot during a fern event. Uh, the characteristic here is that the, the, the fun events uh, lasted for the first two days of this, uh, these graphs. And you see that the day night cycle disappears quite uh, um, almost completely. And you see here the strong nor northerly winds coming from the Alps and the humidity uh, drops completely. The humidity drops very, uh, very, uh, air is very dry and that's the reason why you see the sky very very clearly and the ozone concentration doesn't undergo 
practically uh, um, a, a strong daily cycle because uh, of the strong mixing uh, between the layers because you have the this turbulence which mixes um, the layers and which uh, homogenizes the ozone concentration which is high because the air is coming from higher altitudes where you know that <coughs> ozone is um, at higher concentrations and during these days the ozone concentration practically did not change and the fluxes are also not very not very important because because uh, during strong wind events the stomata close to defend the the plants from this aggressivity of the wind and so there is no penetration of the pollutants to the plants so this is also an important uh, an interesting aspect so i think we we, we are going <coughs> We are approaching the end, and I did not talk about uh, a lot of other problems uh, of uh, micro meteorology and air ecosystems exchange, like the harmonic analysis and spectra <clears throat> and turbulent time series. Because we did it, of course, we calculated the spectra because they they are uh, teaching us a lot of features <clears throat> of the phenomena we observe, but. Then the, you have the stationarity problem, uh, which is a necessary condition for applicability of micro meteorological observation methods. Then we could speak about other methods to measure fluxes, which can be micro meteorological, like the gradient method or the eddy accumulation method, or uh, or uh, not micro meteorological, because you have also enclosure method where, where you enclose leaves. In, in, in enclosures to, to measure what is going, what is entering and what is going out. It's a very simple method, but it's not so easy to use. Uh, then you have, <clears throat> you can verify the validity of the Taylor hypothesis and the existence of spectral gaps. So you have a, a lot of problems which we can study. And uh, I think all these topics can be the subject of further seminars, maybe. And just to uh, to give a touch <coughs> uh, and to, to end that, uh, we can say that technology is not always essential to do good science. Uh, an Italian humorist <coughs> uh, constructed this very simple meteorological station where you have a rope and the, the rope thermometer. Uh, if the he says when the rope the, the rope is dry, nice weather. When the rope is wet, rain. If it's rigid, it's cold, cold weather. When it's invisible, that means that you have fog or drink less. <laughs> and, uh, when you have the moving rope, wind. And when there is no rope, they, some, somebody stole it. Thank you for your attention and see you hopefully uh, soon, maybe in September. Thanks. Thanks, Stan. Thank you very much, Stan. It was really nice and interesting. Thank you. I love, I love the last, last slide. <laughs> uh, uh, now, I guess everyone is used to these uh, meetings, so please, if you mm -hmm. have questions, unmute yourself and ask Stan a question, or you can also uh, write it in the chat and we will try to ask Stan. I will, I will, I will try to see the, the people, but... Uh, uh, Are there any questions? Oh. I have a question, if I may. Yes. Stan? Yes. Nice, nice presentation. I liked it. And I like also the, the way you, you put it in the intro in introduction that reminds us a bit about micrometeorology and the renal decomposition and all that. Mm -hmm. yes. But I have a question.
question about, I mean, you have been talking mostly uh, about daytime observations and yes. uh, uh, in particular when there is uh, convection and, and, and turbulence in the system. Now, mm -hmm. I, you know, in the model, we need also to know what the deposition is. So how would you measure things at night? I mean, is it a different oh. approach or do you think your it can be extrapolated during the night? How do you do that? It's much more difficult to uh, to measure. Well, we measured also we measured also by uh, during the night time, but it's uh, the interpretation is much more difficult because you generally have very few turbulence, so the eddy covariance method is difficult to 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 apply, and also uh, this it's not not homogeneous, not stationary. So uh, we and. Another aspect is that most of the penetration of air pollutants into the plants occur during the daytime and not during the nighttime because because there is a few turbulence and the turbulence is responsible for transporting uh, transferring uh, gases from higher to lower uh, heights. So, so there is practically no um, uptake by plants during the night. And that, that's the problem. So it's very difficult to interpret the nighttime measurements. But there are some groups who are doing that. So what about the boundary layer at night? Because, you know, what I see in the models is that the, it, it appears very often that uh, the, the levels are very, very stable in the model mm. with almost no exchanges from, you know, even from, from what you could call the, the nighttime boundary layer with the free troposphere, mm -hmm. and that there are more changes apparently than what the mods are showing. There is sometimes mechanical turbulence or other, other approaches that mix the things much more than you do it in the mod. But the, the problem is that during, it, it depends what, where you, what you call a uh, boundary layer because yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the nighttime boundary layer is not really a boundary layer it's just a layer uh, with uh, where you have a strong inversion so uh, of course the, the vertical mixing is inhibited and uh, you have very small eddies so uh, you really have to to take all these these uh, fluctuations why one one why <clears throat> one by one and, and to do a, a very fine analysis of that. But it, it, it's not, uh, well, <clears throat> we did measure that, but we did not go in, in, in much detail because it's very complex. But I, I know that there are groups who are doing that. But the results are not so convincing. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions? I have a question. Yes, Olivia. Hi, Stan. Thank you. Nice talk. Um, I had a question about the measurements made in Germany with um, your group and Thomas Foken's yes. group. It looked yes. like um, it looked like the tower was at the edge of the forest. Um, did you actually do eddy covariance measurements at the edge of the forest? And how did you yes. correct for not having horizontal homogeneity? Well, no, no. The, the, we just measured, and uh, we, since we were at the edge uh, of the forest, it was of course very, very difficult. But then um, there are other peoples of the campaign who interpreted uh, that. But uh, I, I think it's very long work, and I, I I'm not sure it's finished yet. But there are a lot of the the problem is that over a forest you have. Uh, these, um, how, how, how to explain that, the, these structures, those stationary eddies. And of course, then uh, you, you have to do with, with the aid of modeling. And there was, the, the, there was a, a professor from, uh, who participated uh, in the campaign, a, a Chinese guy from uh, Washington University, I think. No, from Pullman University, maybe you know him. And he made a, a, a modeling approach <clears throat> uh, with the data of the, this uh, edge 
um, edge measurements, but I, I, I am not aware of, uh, not very aware of the results of that. But it's very, very complicated. Yeah, I mean, it's. I saw a, a recent paper that was talking about the eastern U.S. and mm. there's there's edges around forests in most of the forests in the eastern U.S. and quite quite a lot of them. If you define an edge as you know a certain um, I don't know, I guess, distance from a forest center. And so it, it, it's interesting to think about how exchange changes over those edges. Yes, of course. <laughs> no, it's a very challenging problem. <laughs> So I have a question. This is Ned Patton. Uh, so I'm curious, in your educing of RS, you need to know the aerodynamic resistance as well. And yes. you are doing this over the top of forest canopies, where mm -hmm. the relationships between a gradient and a flux change because of the presence of the canopy itself. And I'm just yes. curious if you uh, made any attempts to account for your measurements being in the roughness, in the sublayer that is affected by the trees itself and correcting for that influence on educing RS. Yes, so <clears throat> the problem is that there is a the very simple model, which is the the monin obukov surface layer theory, <coughs> uh, where you have this resistance, the aerodynamic resistance, the, the, the sublayer resistance. But this is called, called the, the famous uh, big leaf model, where you consider the surface are, as horizontal. But the surface is much more complex, of course, because you have the, the, the <coughs> you have the leaves, which are very uh, uh, three-dimensionally complex. And, um, the existence, for instance, of the um, laminar sublayer, which is very close to the leaf surface. In reality, it's just a representation. It's a, to, to facilitate the interpretation that it's not always present. And this is also a, a problem which we, we could examine. Because okay, well, the, I was just asking about the fact that the fluid mechanics is different. If uh, yes, you're in, if you're in the presence of an inflection point instability at the top of the trees versus in your clearing, let's say, where it would be logarithmic, the wind profiles would be logarithmic all the way to the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fluid mechanics changes. And I was just curious if you interrogated the influence of correcting for that or not on your educing RS. No, no, uh, of course it's completely different. Uh, for, uh, you're in, the, in the clearing, it's very simple. In the forest, it's uh, it's much more complex because you you cannot really divide the the the, um, the, the air layers. You, you you cannot define um, strictly the the layers one above the other. Yep. Thanks. So so you you have these organized structures over the forest. For instance, you have the the, the eddies are going. Uh, maybe you have between two trees, you can have an eddy, for instance, who is stationary. This is this perturbs the the the, the measurements, of course. So you 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 cannot interpret really well the the. Um, you can do it only by with the help of of modeling. Okay, thanks. Are there more questions? Hi, I, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, uh, we have some uh, measurements in uh, China uh, in history rehabilitation. Uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, flux measurements uh, in a matrix uh, in hmm. all these areas. Yeah, there are some uh, flux towers uh, over the uh, mates and some uh, flux towers are over the bare ground. They are in the same area. So I don't know if we can calculate uh, uh, stomatal uh, transfer reason with this uh, flux uh, matrix me measurement. In theory, 
theory you can do it, but uh, we uh, we have to know wh how is wh what is the structure of this uh, uh, of the site. Uh, the site is uh, about uh, five kilometers, uh, uh, multi five kilometers. It's a square area, about uh, twenty uh, adequate instrument in this area. Oh, oh, oh. but are there trees or, or low vegetation? Uh, it's uh, oasis area uh, planted by maize. Ah, maize, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maize. And in this maize area, uh, uh, there are some villages. We also have uh, measured uh, the flux in, uh, in villages. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah, so we, we want to know if we can uh, calculate the maize transpiration uh, with uh, this uh, flux matrix. Yes, yes, I think so. You know, it's, uh, a maize field uh, is very well suited for that kind of measurements. Yeah, yeah. We have published some papers of this observation. I can uh, send to you a dis uh, discuss with you later. Ah, yes. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it will be nice if you guys can connect by email, I guess. Or okay. Yes, of course, of course. You know my email. Thank okay. You. Yes. Other questions? Are there are there more questions? If not, I think it's it's a little bit late. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, Stan and everyone. I guess it's it's time to say bye. And I really appreciate appreciate Stan that you presented today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot and thanks everyone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Stan. We'll talk soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stan again. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye, Stan. Bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, Stan. Bye.